Okay, everyone, thanks for joining me today. Um, very pleased to see everyone in the room as well as uh, I know people are joining us online. So I'm uh, pleased to be able to reach people in different, different formats today. Uh, I would say it's, it's actually great to be able to have people in person for this. It's been a couple of years and it's always difficult for me to do this just talking to my, to, to my computer. <laughs> so I appreciate people being with me today. Um, I am really pleased to be here to, to share an update uh, of the school with our community and um, reflect on everything that we've accomplished uh, during the past ag academic year and also to share a little bit about some goals going forward for next year. Um, and as always, for every, every one of these, I encourage you to share whatever you hear today with, with your colleagues. This I would encourage you to do so. So please um, feel free to, to uh, share whatever you hear that you like today. So. Um, our academic year this year has been marked by a, a number of, of important milestones, um, and I'm going to talk about many of those today. Uh, before I do that, though, I, I, I want to start by actually offering my thanks to everyone in our organization, and I mean the staff, I mean the faculty, and I mean the students. We owe each other a collective thank you. Um, I don't, I don't know if I can personally thank people enough for what they've contributed to the school over the past year. Um, and, and I recognize the, the, the level of commitment that each of you make towards our missions for research, for education, and for patient care. And uh, you've, you've been, particularly, you've been focused on meeting those missions under the most difficult circumstances, which was created by the pandemic. And, and that added level of stress, stress on everyone is enormous. So I just, I want to thank everyone in the school, everyone at DH for the remarkable strength and perseverance that you've shown to, to meet our missions uh, throughout the year. What I, my own experience, what I know is that many parts of our personal lives got put on hold during the pandemic, but, but um, the missions for the school didn't get put on hold. And so we were all trying to fulfill the missions of the school at the same time we were trying to juggle enormous changes in our personal lives. Um, and so I just recognize the, the uh, extensive effort that everyone has put together. And I, I, would, I would say, uh, in my opinion, as a milestone, that's a collective milestone that we should all celebrate. Um, that was something that, uh, that we went through all last year together. And uh, I just think we need to all pause, take a moment and recognize how much we accomplished last year under really difficult circumstances. Um, I uh, went back, as I was preparing this talk, I went back to look at what I shared last year, and um, I, I spoke last year about how the school was successfully meeting the challenges of co the COVID pandemic, and that we were emerging with optimism and returning to in-person activities. And, <clears throat> well, I think we all know what happened after that. Uh, there was the Delta variant surge, uh, and then there was the Omicron variant surge. Uh, and so I guess for me, lesson learned, I'm, I'm not going to try and make proclamations about the COVID pandemic today. So uh, I, I do, though, want to share my appreciation for how much everyone in our community has, has uh, met these challenges with, with the utmost in mutual respect and uh, mutual support. And I would cite in particular, the high rate of vaccination among our community is really important because that has helped reduce the incidence of severe disease and, and as, as the case numbers have risen in our community. So I just really appreciate everyone, everyone taking it as a matter of personal responsibility to, to protect each other. Um, I'm hoping that the talk today gives you a better sense for how much we've accomplished together uh, during this year um, and also uh, a sense of things that are on our immediate horizon. So there's, there's uh, actually a lot to cover. So I look forward to it. So. The first uh, is always fun for me. I'd like to start by recognizing the appointment of several new leaders in, in the organization during this academic year. So uh, I'm going to start with Erica Brown as our new Dean of Faculty Affairs. Erica uh, joins us, uh, joined us in mid-December, and um, she brings a wealth of experience in, in the areas of faculty recruitment and faculty development. And some of you may have already been experiencing that as she's, as she's been building out her office. I would next welcome and uh, please join me in welcoming Nick Ryan as our chief of staff. Uh, Nick began in this role at the beginning of January and many of you are familiar with Nick through his leadership in uh, the LCME recreditation process as well as uh, 
in le his leadership for the Kern National Network program that we have here, that we're a part of here. Um, in particularly, I start with Erica and Nick because um, it was through their recruitments that we recognized that there was an important need uh, for, to support our community through additional resources that we've committed and new staff positions that we've committed to the Dean's office. And those new positions are under their leadership and really we're, we're doing this so that the school can better serve you and your departments in fulfilling our missions. So uh, I wanna start with that within the immediate Dean's office. Next, I wanna to turn to our academic leadership. So I'm very pleased to welcome Beth Wilson who began her role as chair of the Department of Community and Family Medicine in March. Um, I'm, I'm really excited to have her. She's, she's a, a bundle of energy and I'm, I'm excited to, to learn more about what she's gonna to bring to our, to our programs. I'm also very pleased to, to welcome Amber Barnato as the new director of the Dartmouth Institute for Health Policy and Clinical Practice. Um, she began uh, last summer and what has also been appointed to the Wenberg Distinguished Professorship. In addition to these appointments, I am very happy to share with our community the appointments of Kevin McGuire, Will Torrey, and Arif Surawanada as interim chairs for the departments of orthopedics, of psychiatry, and of pathology and laboratory medicine, uh, respectively. I'm really grateful that they were uh, willing and interested in stepping up into these leadership roles. And um, they're, they're incredibly helpful and talented individuals who will guide those departments as I work with DH leadership on a strategic framework to fill the, the department leadership positions uh, over time beyond an interim period. I, I'm also gonna share in recognizing these new leaders that are in the school, I'm gonna pause here for a moment just to recognize the individuals who held these positions prior to their arrival. Uh, and I'd like to just take a moment to recognize and thank those individuals. So that's Faith Goodness, Leslie Henderson, Kathy Morrow, David Jevsevar, Alan Green, and Wendy Wells. I, I, you know, the recruitment of new academic and department leadership uh, is, is one of my most important jobs. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm as equally proud of, of the new leaders who step into these roles as I am for the leaders who are stepping out of those roles for whatever reason. Uh, Faith Goodness, you know, was just a tireless and humble supporter of all of our staff. She was just someone who supported everything we did in the medical school in the background. Leslie Henderson, in addition to her faculty role, spent more than a decade as Dean of Faculty Affairs and helped champion the evolution of our promotions and criteria and processes. Uh, Kathy Morrow, I would say, was just a dynamic leader for community and family medicine and was tireless in the way in which she led efforts to ensure fair treatment for everyone in our organization and also to ensure that our programs supported the learning environment for our students. David Jevsevar led a transformational growth of the research and education programs in the Department of Orthopedics. And uh, I'm, I'm really proud of him and I'm, I wish him the, be the very best as he moves to uh, become CEO of Ortho Virginia. Wendy Wells' leadership was equally propelled the Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine uh, and really to new levels and her contributions to education and research uh, were unparalleled. And actually the way in which she and the programs she had in pathology and lab medicine engaged with faculty and students across the entire organization that that department collabor is so collaborative. And it's a spirit that, that Wendy uh, fostered. And in psychiatry, I observed Alan Green's uh, passing last year. And, you know, I think we all miss his energy and miss his enthusiasm. And I miss... Uh, I miss hearing his, his voice in our meetings. Uh, with respect to open searches for school leadership, we, we have two ongoing positions that are open right now within the Dean's office. One is the Associate Dean for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Um, let me just start by thanking the search committee that's, that's been helping to uh, uh, evaluate candidates for that. Um, you know, that committee put a lot of time and effort into the search process, both last year and this year. And I'm, I uh, really am hopeful to communicate some good news around that position in the very near future. So I just want to recognize the search committee for their, their efforts there. And in April, we formally launched a national search process for a new senior associate dean for foundational research. So that, that process is just launching and getting underway. So this is uh, a time for me of a uh, time of pride for me actually um, to welcome our new faculty to Geisel. Um, 
it is impossible to have them all on one slide. And so I'm gonna step through the next series of slides to, to show you all of the new faculty that have joined Geisel uh, over the past year. Um, and I'll highlight a few of our new faculty in, in, in fact, in all departments. So I think that's one of the thing, the messages that's really important here about the, the number of faculty that have joined across the entire organization. And the departments are listed here in alphabetical order. It's a long list, so I'm sorry if I'm not giving you enough time to read the whole list. This will be available afterwards for everyone to look through. This is actually a list that this extends this a little bit. These are individuals who have accepted and are arriving this summer. So in addition to faculty, the previous lists were faculty who had joined already during the academic year, and these are folks arriving this summer. <clears throat> All right. Um, our faculty, to me, is amazing. Uh, they continue to make important contributions to to research, to education, and to patient care. And uh, you know, their their efforts receive national attention. And um, I am always very proud to share with you this list of some of the some of the notable notable achievements and awards and recognitions that our faculty have received over the past year. Um, it, it, it's one, one of my favorite activities is to create these lists of awards and recognitions for our faculty and our staff and our students. Um, it just shows the strength of our, our organization and the people who work here and our training here. Uh, in particular, in this list, I, I'd like to highlight the many national recognitions that our faculty receive from their professional societies. This to me is actually really important because the, those accolades represent um, achievements that are recommended by their peers in their respective academic disciplines. And in my opinion, um, that's one of the highest honors that you can receive as an academician to have your own peers uh, nominate and, and select you for awards because our profession is rooted in peer review and peer assessment. And so to have your peers recommend you for these is, I think, very powerful. So um, please remember these names. And, and when you see these individuals, join me in congratulating them for, for their accomplishments. Uh, this year, I was able to nominate many of our faculty and, and, and from all corners of the, of the institution for, uh, endowed, for uh, appointment into endowed professorships. Uh, the positions celebrate the contributions of our faculty. They also serve as very important and powerful tools for us to help recruit outstanding faculty to Geisel. And I'll, I'll highlight two examples here, which I think are very important. Let me get the pointer activated here. Dr. Curiel and Dr. Vadat were, were uh, uh, individuals who joined us very recently in part uh, through the support from these two endowed professorships and um, they serve as important leadership roles in the Cancer Center. So I'm very excited to have them join our, our, our faculty ranks. I'm very pleased to highlight the contributions of our faculty to the medical education program. And this is a, a list of the faculty who are selected by the students for special recognition awards. And it's because of their exceptional contributions to both the preclinical and the clinical curriculum. And again, I, I would encourage you to, to review these names. And when you see these individuals in our organization, just, just uh, congratulate them on this and thank them for their, their work. And again, I wanna emphasize that um, these are preclinical awards. These are also clinical uh, cl awards for preclinical teaching and for clinical teaching in the clinical environment. Now I'm going to transition. I, I think there's equal recognition for, for our staff and staff positions in the medical school. And um, I've got a few slides just to uh, highlight the individuals that were uh, appointed into staff positions in the medical school during the past year. Um, I, I would 
point out that the individuals who are in highlights here are individuals who received a promotion in the medical school or, or, or a promotion from some other division in Dar Dartmouth into the medical school. And I've got a couple messages that are, I think are important here, but I'll, I'll, I'll step through the slides um, just so you can see this. Again, these are individuals who have been in, in staff positions and they're throughout uh, all corners of the organization. The messages, I think, to me, they're really clear um, as we put together this list. One of them is that Geisel is an attractive place to work. And since we've been able to recruit a lot of, of faculty members during the year, um, I just would encourage everyone to, to recognize how many staff we've added just in this last academic year and know that, that it's an attractive place for people to work. The second is, and, and this is denoted by these highlights, is um, the staff can advance in their roles and be promoted within Geisel. So that, I think that's a really important message for staff to know and to hear. Um, so it's, it's a good place to work and, and you can, you can do, do well while you're working here. Uh, our staff also excel in what they do. So I'm going to uh, show you staff awards here. Um, each year, Dartmouth College recognizes outstanding contributions from staff with what they refer to as the Lone Pine Awards. And I am very pleased to share that um, that Geisel had two staff members recognized this year for a lone, with a Lone Pine Award. Uh, Amanda Bassett was selected for her commitment to diversity and inclusion in part through her recent work with, to form affinity groups among our alumni. And Mickey Yeager was selected as an unsung hero through her tireless and amazing support of our students as our registrar. And again, these are our staff who are just tirelessly supporting what we're doing. And I, I would ask you to congratulate them, congratulate them when, you, when you see them. Uh, one thing, the, the Lone Pine Awards, the ceremony was for that was, was planned this spring, earlier this spring. It was canceled due to COVID. I think they're going to plan another ceremony sometime in the near future. I don't know when that is, but uh, I would just say the official ceremony for this has not been has not been conducted yet, but I, I wanted to share this with you anyway. So I'm, I'm out in front of Dartmouth College again on this one. So indulge me on that. Um, I also wanna recognize our students and trainees do fantastic and uh, they are also uh, recognized nationally for many different awards. And um, I've just shared with you a list here of, of many of the different uh, individuals in our organization who are receiving national recognition for what they're doing. Um, and it's, again, it's a testimony to the strength of our training programs, to the strength of our, our, our students and trainees. Um, and it's just always a joy to put this together and learn about all the uh, outstanding things that our students are doing. Now, let me take a moment just to, to go through some uh, special recognitions. Uh, there are also always things happening during the year that um, don't fall neatly on a particular list, and, but, they, but they require special recognition. Um, first, let me recognize the extraordinary ge generosity of the Byrne family for a gift that has created the Byrne Family Cancer Research Institute at our Dartmouth Cancer Center. Um, th this gift w is, is just an, an extraordinary expression of generosity uh, from that family. It's a gift that will elevate our cancer research and Honestly, it has already drawn uh, attention by other interested, interested individuals who, who seek a way to, to partner to elevate our cancer research programs. The gift is also in many respects historic and not just because of the scale of it, but, but because of the nature of it. It, is, um, it, it brings together Geisel and, and Dartmouth Health in, in partnership in support of cancer research and across the full spectrum of science all the way from discovery science, all the way to cl clinical trials. And it's, and it's a gift that's, that's designed on purpose to, to support the two organizations in partnership to achieve that, achieve that goal. So it's a, it's a really historic gift. And I think our community uh, is, is blessed to have it. Next, I wanna thank uh, Dr. Kimienti and the entire community and staff of, uh, community of staff and faculty um, who participate in medical student training and explicitly for their efforts to lead our reaccreditation by the LCME this past year. Um, we received full reaccreditation from the LCME and I, I think um, everyone should take a moment and, 
and share in that accomplishment. It is a big job and I, I would like everyone to, to feel uh, a sense of pride about that. Um, receiving full accreditation is, is clearly a vote of confidence in the quality of our medical education program, but I would say there is still a lot of work for us to do. Uh, the reaccreditation that we received did not come with a, a, a defined term, so our term is, is said to be still pending. Um, this, is, this is actually a new procedural step that the LCME is, is using, and I know that Dr. Kimienti has led efforts to develop very detailed action plans to address each of the concerns that's, that was raised by the, by the survey team when they conducted this, the, the site visit. Um, we will be presenting the action plans to the LCME Secretariat in a few weeks, and um, those action plans will form the basis for uh, our response to a limited survey team visit coming in early 2023. So uh, we need to take credit for our full reaccreditation. However, we still have a lot of work to do going forward. Next is the strategic planning process. And as many of you are aware, we launched that comprehensive process uh, in August of last year. Here, I just wanna uh, recognize and, and express my gratitude to the faculty and staff and students uh, who are serving on the steering committee to help guide that process. What I haven't shown on here is all the many people who, who participated either in uh, as members of, of working groups or um, as, as uh, people who are interviewed or participated in the community forums. Um, the list of names is, is almost too long. So uh, I just wanna say, I wanna highlight the steering committee for their role in helping to shape the, the, the process and, and guide the process. But I wanna thank all of the community that's participated in, in bringing forth ideas and, and contributing to our overall strategic planning process. Next, I wanna thank Eric Lansigan for his service as Interim Associate Dean of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion during this past year. Uh, Eric has provided exceptional leadership to the DICE Office uh, for student programming and for efforts to bring our entire community across DH and Geisel together in a, in a shared purpose. Uh, and I think I really wanna to, want to thank Eric for stepping into that role with, with real gusto and, and, and leading us during the past year. The Steering Committee for Restorative Justice is next. And you know this was formed in the wake of the events related to the student honor code issue last year. Um, we, we convened the Steering Committee for Restorative Justice to lead our processes and discussions within our community as a way to recognize the harms that were committed during that, those events and, and in ways to uh, identify how we can heal those harms. Um, Again, this is a, a, a committee that was formed of faculty and staff and students, and I really want to thank them for committing their time and energy into this, this committee. Um, they've really been thoughtful in guiding the process and guiding the thinking about how we approach this challenging subject. What we have been doing is having uh, discussion groups, and some of you have participated in those discussion groups, that, or as, as in, in the vernacular of, of uh, restorative justice, they're called circles. Um, I, I appreciate everyone's willingness to be engaged in that process and in those conversations. Um, I private, provided a status update on this work a few weeks ago, and, and that video is archived and accessible for those uh, that haven't seen it and wish to do so. Um, going forward, we anticipate uh, the completion of a root cause analysis or incident review, depending on how you like to frame it. Um, that's being prepared by an independent group. Um, and we're looking forward to that uh, report to help us identify what went wrong and kind of what steps can we take to prevent such an episode from ever recurring. And when that uh, report is complete, I'm looking forward to a, a, a time when we can have an open discussion with our entire community. And I look forward to being able to uh, have that hosted by the steering committee and where I can stand alongside the, the steering committee to, to participate in that. I would also say, and it's not highlighted here, but simultaneously, Dr. Kimienti has been leading a task force that was charged to review our policies and our processes for student uh, advancement and promotion. And that task force is drafting recommendations for changes to our current policies. 
and it's in the middle of receiving feedback on those on those drafts um, prior to moving them forward for formal review and approval through the governing bodies, for example, the Medical Education Committee. Um, I do believe that the, the proposed changes will be well received by our students and by our community. And I think the timeline for that is to have those uh, available and ready to go in, uh, early for early after, soon after our first year students have, have started. And lastly, I would really like to call out uh, members of our faculty who have devoted their time to serve on the Dartmouth COVID Science Advisory Group. Um, this was a group that was convened by the provost and the senior vice president of Dartmouth, and it was convened specifically to provide them with, with scientific advice about how, as, as they considered every step in managing the pandemic on the Dartmouth campus. So uh, I really appreciate the, uh, their, their contributions to helping guide Dartmouth through the, through the pandemic. Now, let me take a moment just to, to, to do a remembrance. Um, uh, I, I wanna uh, take just a moment of silence for Lo Chang Wu. He's an emeritus professor of physiology and neurobiology um, who passed away earlier this year. And for many of you uh, will remember his, uh, his wife actually ran a, a food service here in, in, uh, the, Rems, uh, in the Kellogg building for, for many, many years. So we got familiar with her through that process. So please just join me in a moment of silence. Okay, thank you. Um, let me turn my attention to our financial picture. Um, the chart here shows our revenues and expenses for the past few years um, for the budget that was approved for our current fiscal year, the projection for our current fiscal year. We're, we're almost, we're nearing the end of the fiscal year so we can project where, where we'll land and also the budget that was approved for the forth, forthcoming fiscal year. And here's where I'll activate the pointer. Um, you can see the previous fiscal years here. This was the budget that was approved for our current fiscal year. This is our current projection as we near uh, the end of this, this fiscal year in a, in a month, uh, about two months. And this is the budget that was submitted to start uh, the next fiscal year on July 1st. Uh, there's a few in, important points that I'd like to cover here. So um, the first is that we are we are now projecting to end the fisc this fiscal year on June 30th with a, a slight surplus. You can see that here. Um, this is actually the third third consecutive year where we will end the year with a budget surplus. So you can see uh, the current year and the previous two years here and here. Um, and, you know, the fact that we're ending with budget surpluses does speak to the overall financial strength of Geisel uh, now, and it also, also serves as a really important reminder that we're on a sol solid foundation to support many of the investments that we propose to do and, and, and implement. And when I talk about investments, I'm talking about recruitment of staff, I'm talking about recruitment of faculty, retention of faculty, support to programs, for example, and uh, we uh, increase in support for DEI programming, investments in facility improvements to support our research and education programs. All of that is something that I put in, in the category for us for, for thinking about investment. Our uh, budget for fiscal year 23 that was approved by the trustees in March is essentially at break even. Uh, you can see that right here. Uh, that's a $200,000 margin on a $200 million budget. So it's essentially uh, essentially break even, break even. What I'd like to do though is, is, instead of, is, is move away from the specific numbers um, and talk a little bit more about what are the drivers that underline, underlie each, each of these, both the, this current fiscal year and the next fiscal year. Um, in fiscal year 22, um, there are a few things that really improved our budget position as the year went by. So one of those was increased proposal volume and award success. And I've just listed a few of the, of the awards that came through during uh, this current academic year. Um, some of these are actually hosted by Dartmouth-Hitchcock. Uh, so they're, the, financially, they're running through Dartmouth-Hitchcock, but they're, they're all contributing to our overall research ecosystem that we have between us. And um, so we've seen really good award success across all of our faculty. Uh, let's see another, um, 
We actually, uh, in the midst of the COVID pandemic, had included some projections for negative impacts of, of COVID. Um, and uh, many of those didn't materialize in the way that we had, had projected them. So that actually was a benefit to us in our, in our budget. Uh, we also met all of our enrollment targets in our education programs, which is really important, uh, both for the vitality of the program, uh, as well from a budget position in terms of the tuition revenues. And the distribution from Dr. Seuss Enterprises was higher than we had, had, had planned. So um, that is a continuing source of very important revenue to the school. Um, as we experienced these uh, positive impacts on our budget during the year, we realized that we had an opportunity at that time to better support our faculty. And so uh, I've included this bullet point here because in, in the middle of the, of the academic year last year, um, we worked with the department chairs to, to implement a plan to increase faculty salaries in, in the middle of the year. So um, this is an, it was just presented us with an opportunity that we saw, thought we could be more helpful to, to our faculty. Looking forward in fiscal year 23, um, our budget for next year, again, as I said, is near break even and includes many new investments. And I, the one I want to start off with at the top is that we budgeted for a 0% tuition increase. This is the second year in a row that we have done this. Um, and really, it's part of our ongoing effort to try and reduce the cost of attendance for our students and to reduce their graduation debt when they're finished. Um, we, we included a uh, uh, um, substantial salary increase for all staff and faculty. And that is done in with two parts. One is a 4% baseline wage increase to everyone. And then there was, in addition to that, there was a variable merit pool that each local unit leader or a department head or, or, uh, or director got to use to uh, add to that 4% baseline. Um, we also budgeted for a, a, over 10% increase for graduate student stipends, recognizing that we had, had grown uh, over the years behind a competitive position relative to other schools, as well as to recognize the very challenging uh, housing market in the local, local community for, for our graduate students. We budgeted 10 capital projects. Um, We've, and, and, and so those, those will be playing out over the next year, and we've included a placeholder for investments in new initiatives that will merge from the strategic plan. So we didn't want to do a strategic plan without thinking about how we might implement some of those, those initiatives. So we've budgeted a placeholder for that. Um, and that latter point is really important because the strategic planning process is, is probably going to mature and be complete uh, by September, and that'll give us time to think about how do we start implementing some of those initiatives that arise. Now, before I move on, I just want to stop and, and share that, you know, uh, a, a few years ago, um, we were facing a, a very steep financial challenge in the medical school. And I'm, I am well aware that I asked a lot of people in our community to help make changes to address that financial challenge that we had in the school. And I know how difficult that was. I know how disruptive it was. And I know um, how much stress that that included and added to everyone. But what I would hope that everyone can see is the way that the, the sort of taking those hard steps at that time has now put us on a very solid financial foundation. And on that foundation, we can now support new investments. And the investments that I talked about in staff, in faculty, in facilities, we can do that now because of our financially sound, sound financial uh, our financially sound position. Now, let me talk about partnerships for a moment. Uh, a, a very important part about how we support our programs is through partnerships with donors. And those donors make philanthropic investments and gifts in the school to support and enhance all of our mission areas. And I just provide this list to, to note some of the, the gifts that um, uh, we received during this past year. Uh, this, is, this is just a, a short list showing some of them. Um, it, it, it does serve to, to highlight the generosity of our alumni, of members of the Board of Advisors, of members of our community, and it includes support for many of our key areas in research and education. And these were driven by our, our campaign and our campaign plan. So all of these gifts are actually aligned to our campaign and how we foresaw trying to support our programs in the school. 
uh, when we developed the campaign priorities. Um, I think it's really important that we recognize that we have now exceeded our campaign goal for the, the Dartmouth call to lead campaign. That was a goal of $207 million. We have exceeded that um, through, through our fundraising efforts. And in the current year, we're over $80 million raised so far, and that's as of April 30th. So we're not even finished with the current year. So um, I would like to call out though that it, that $86 million is already the, the single highest number of, for one, one year of fundraising in our existence of the school. So um, this is a really important uh, milestone for us. Um, and the year isn't finished yet. So I, I actually know some of our, our advancement officers are really excited to try and push that a little further. Um, what I wanna do though is use that as, as an opportunity to talk a little bit about uh, our fundraising strategy. And um, I show you this, this is our year to year fundraising uh, going back multiple years. Um, and this is the fundraising that's, that's supported by the staff in the, the medical and healthcare advancement office. Um, it supports both Dar Geisel and Dartmouth Hitchcock. Um, and I wanna point out a couple of things. One is the, the recent years, the trend line for that is, is, is on a, a positive and upward slope. We, we've actually conducted a, a feasibility study for fundraising for a combined Dartmouth Medicine and Dartmouth Health campaign. And that feasibility work projects that we could see sustained $100 million annually in fundraising. And um, you, what, if, you, if you draw the trend line from, of where we're going, you can see that that, that looks, looks like a, a reasonable goal. And that is an aspirational goal that Joanne Conroy and I would like to reach. Now, in the background, I just share with you some of the keys to that recipe that's, that's helping to contribute to the successes we've seen recently and to support that kind of aspiration. Uh, there's a lot of things in that recipe. Um, one is that we've been able to recruit and engage a really outstanding group of, of fundraising professionals. Uh, another is the alignment of leadership around our, our fundraising goals. And, and that's alignment between leadership between Geisel and DH, so Joanna, myself, and other leaders in, in the organizations, but also alignment with the boards that's, that, that serve and advise our organizations. Another factor is uh, the, the generation of very compelling and big ideas. Uh, I think the gift that, uh, the, the Byrne family gift that um, supported the Cancer Center at the establishment of the Byrne Family Cancer Research Institute is an example where a big idea really catches hold with the donor and, and gets excitement and, and allows us to do things. And there are other big ideas that we have that, that, can, that I think we can reach similar goals. And then, um, I would say the partnership with Dartmouth College advancement officers with, with Dartmouth Hitchcock or Dartmouth Health, excuse me, Dartmouth Health, and with the with DHMC, all of these things in terms of, of partnerships and, and, and professionals working together are really part of that recipe that's leading to this success. I want to step back though and really give credit where it's due. I want to credit Matt Haig and the staff that are in all the areas of the medical and healthcare advancement for their help in really helping us chart this trajectory and, and, and lead us on this path. Um, I say all areas because that team reaches new and existing donors, they reach alumni, they reach community members, they, they plan events, they connect with foundations. It is comprehensive in what they're doing and, and every part of that office is contributing to, to the success. So I really wanna thank each and every member of, of the medical and healthcare advancement team. Um, and I can't name them all because it's a big office, but I want, I, I really want each person in that office to know that uh, we appreciate what they're doing. So now let's look ahead. What's on the horizon? Uh, we have had a very busy year. We have a very busy year ahead of us. Um, so let me say first and foremost, I need to complete the recruitment of leaders in the administration to help support our missions. So I am hopeful that the search for the Associate Dean for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion will be complete soon. Uh, com I'll communicate that as, as soon as that gets completed. Uh, in April, we open a national search for the Senior Associate Dean for Foundational Research. Uh, I'm excited to see the applicant pool that the, the search committee selects for that position. Um, 
The search itself opened a little later than I had 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 wanted or uh, had hoped for, but um, we are underway now. So I'm, I'm looking forward to, to that moving forward. Um, as I mentioned, we have a lot of work to do ahead in terms of completing the LCM urea accreditation. Um, and notably, uh, there will be a limited survey team visit in early 2023. Um, we'll be working hard between now and then to really position ourselves for, for success in that process. Um, it's a lot of work and it's, it's, it's requiring us to draw on resources from, from, from every corner from the medical education community. Um, next up, and not far on the heels is, uh, of that, is the reaccreditation for our MPH program. That's going to take center stage very soon. Um, they are currently conducting their internal survey to collect the necessary data to inform the application for their reaccreditation by uh, the CEPH. Um, so we'll be working closely with them to assist in the successful reaccreditation of that program as well. And the strategic planning process, uh, we'll be completing that process, I anticipate that we'll begin implementing some of the initiatives that have been identified in that plan. And <clears throat> I'll take a, a couple of minutes to talk a little bit more in depth about, this, about what's coming together through the strategic planning process and, and, and next steps in turning, terms of getting that completed. So the overall approach was to, to, to have our values drive our actions. And uh, that was really an important uh, principle on which to base our strategic planning process and conversations. Uh, that, that process then, be, because of that, that process included a, a crowdsourcing effort to identify our key values in our community to help guide the process. And these five pillars uh, represent the, the values that have emerged from uh, that crowdsourcing effort in our, in our conversations. Integrity, inclusion, respect, equity, and excellence. And I think, I, I just, I think this is very reflective of our, of our community and, and what we see. So I'm excited to use these as the foundation to build forward. Now, the, the planning process itself is, um, developed nine separate initiatives, and each of these are, are becoming the basis for the overall strategic plan for, for Geisel going forward. Um, each of the initiatives uh, has a, a list of, of tactical steps that are, that are underneath them. I'm not going to list in all of those here. That is available on the SharePoint site for the strategic planning process. I encourage you to go, to go look at that and read that. Um, but those tactical steps, we've already started internally in the dean's office looking at, 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 at where those tactical steps lie within the organization in terms of who should be accountable for those and, and how we can start implementing them to carry this forward. What is most impressive to me is how the key values that were identified on the previous slide are really reveal themselves through each of these initiatives. And in this plan really resides a very strong guide towards how we support the people that work in our organization. And, and that is people across their entire career arc, regardless of where they sit in our organization, there's something in, our, in this strategic plan to support them. Be it a student, be it a postgraduate trainee, be it a staff person, a junior faculty or senior faculty, it's really a remarkable set of initiatives to me. And, and it's rooted in values that are designed to support our people in their roles and fulfill the missions of the school. So uh, I'm really excited about moving this forward. Um, in terms of overall process, um, we've gotten a lot of input from our community into developing uh, these, these initiatives. We're in the process of converting this into a written document. Um, we will share that draft document with the community again for additional feedback. And, and that will, in, in, after we include that feedback, that will lead to a final document that we anticipate completing around September. That's, that's where I kind of see the timeline right now. Um, it, it, it is a crowdsourced strategic plan. And I think that is what makes it, makes it uh, the, the strongest it can be. And I really can see within this, the ways it informs a path that will inspire philanthropic support. There's a path here where we can expand our educational offerings to reach more learners and really to reach more learners who can benefit from our very intimate education approach to education. Uh, there's a path to deliberately expand our interprofessional education programs, a path to increase the breadth and depth of our research programs, and a path where we 
we'll, we can be recognized as the best in class for the way we support our faculty and our staff and our students. And so that, that is what I see that's, that this, this strategic plan opens a path for us. So that I am going to conclude the, the talk today. I really wanna thank you for, for your attention. Um, it has been a really busy year and I, I wanna thank each and every person in the organization for how you've contributed to making this school so strong and making it what it is. I do hope that each of you found something that was interesting in the presentation today. Uh, I'm looking forward to the next year. I, Outside of the pandemic, I do have a sense of optimism for the school going forward next year. Uh, I won't make any pro proclamations about the pandemic like I did last year. Um, but I am optimistic for what we can do together. Uh, and uh, I just want to say, uh, you know, profound thanks to all of our faculty and staff and students for everything that you've committed to this school, uh, your engagement in what we're doing and the support for all of our missions, the research programs, the education programs, and the way in which we we support outstanding patient care. So thank you all for coming today and thank you all for tuning in on, on Zoom.